Hello and welcome to the Living Your Best Life webinar series presented by the Huntsman World Senior Games. This is a monthly webinar that covers a wide variety of topics that are designed to help you live your best life. My name is Kyle Case and I have the pleasure of serving as the Chief Executive Officer of the Huntsman World Senior Games. And so we're going to get to our expert presenter. Dr. Fife is a member of the Utah Optometric Association. He's also a member of the American Optometric Association and a member of Vision Source, which is the premier network of private practice optometrists in the United States. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Optometry. Dr. Fife is also the founder and CEO of Paradise Canyon Eye Care, which opened in 2008 right here in St. George, Utah, USA. He says that he sees patients ages three and above, but the majority of his patients are over the age of 50. And although he treats many eye diseases in his practice, Dr. Fife has carved out a niche in his efforts to diagnose age-related macular degeneration early and slow down its effects on vision loss. Dr. Fife, welcome. It looks like you're still on mute there, Dr. Fife. Thank you. It's been a pleasure yeah, being here. Here we go. Well, we're, uh, we're glad that you could join us. And uh, as I said in the introduction, we're very excited and interested to learn about eye health. Hey, this is something that affects all of us. We all want to make sure that we maintain our eye health. And uh, Dr. Fife, you have got quite a few um, certifications and designations. So uh, we're excited to learn from your expertise. This is a question that I have that I'm just going to ask you because I've got you here. Um, how long does it take to become an optometrist? So four years of, of uh, undergrad and then four years of optometry school. Okay. So uh, it takes a little bit of time, a little bit of commitment. Yes, it does. Awesome. Awesome. Well, like I said, we're very excited to learn from you and looking forward to learning how we can better and best care for our eyes. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn the rest of the time over to Dr. Fife, and then we will answer your questions at the end of his presentation. So Dr. Fife, take it away. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Let me get my screen up here to share with you all. Okay. So I was asked to speak on the path to better eye health, or I can see clearly now, and I want to keep it that way. So again, I appreciate the opportunity to come and present with uh, all people here at Huntsman World Senior Games. Uh, the athletes and those that, that work here. Um, in my office, our, uh, what we like to say is we believe life is all about your vision. So I'm going to get started uh, with just kind of uh, going through the years, you know, when we're, when we're from birth to a toddler, our vision changes, going through elementary school, all the way up to high school and through high school, uh, our vision continues to change quite a bit. Um, and then of course, around age 25, 26, it begins to stable, become more stable. Um, and then um, a few years later, around age 40, we start to realize that, hey, we just are not able to see very close up or very well up close. So we go get our, our first um, reading pair of glasses or bifocals. Um, as we continue to age, uh, we start to realize that um, maybe our, our vision's not uh, as good as it used to be. It might be starting to get a little bit dim. Um, and around about age 65, one in three people will have some sort of loss of vision. And I, it's important to understand that, that vision loss or, or eye, um, eye diseases are not necessarily uh, normal. Okay, they're common, but they're not normal. Uh, and most, much of the vision loss that is experienced is avoidable. And I think that's one of the things that you need to understand. Uh, and I'm gonna try to point out and in my presentation today, what you can do to avoid vision loss. Uh, and so the reason being is there are consequences for having um, vision loss. It, it affects our, our daily lifestyles. Um, we can be socially uh, feel isolated, uh, go into depression. Uh, we have less mobility when we, we lose vision. We may fall, have fractures. And of course we don't like where that goes. And overall, we just have a loss of, of independent living, which you know, this is an active community and nobody wants to have 
you know, be told what we have to do or where we, where we can go because we can't see on our own. So it's important that we uh, try to maintain quality vision as long as possible. So what are the uh, main causes of vision loss? Uh, there's four most common causes of blindness uh, as we age. Age-related macular degeneration is the most common. Glaucoma, cataracts, diabetic retinopathy. Um, now, dry eye is not necessarily something you'd think that would cause vision loss, but it is definitely something that uh, becomes more common as we age. And so I've got that. I'm going to cover that. And eye misalignment. I've got a question mark there because um, it's not necessarily an age-related issue, um, but it is common and it's, and it's becoming more common. And a lot of people don't understand uh, the, the signs and symptoms. And as parents and grandparents, uh, you may be in a position after you hear this to identify um, some things that may help your, your children or grandchildren, um, help them to know where to go get help because uh, it's often oftentimes mis, misdiagnosed. Uh, so vision impairments often go untreated. As I mentioned earlier, one third of new blindness is completely avoidable. So the age-related macular degeneration okay, is the most common cause of loss of vision. Uh, it causes the loss of our central vision. It doesn't affect the peripheral, but it does affect the central vision. And of course, as we, um, as we age, it becomes more common. That's why it's called age-related macular degeneration. At age 52, one in 12 people will start to show signs of macular degeneration. At age 60, it's one in nine. And then at age 75, one in three. So you can see how common it becomes as we age. Caucasians are more likely to become to have macular degeneration because of their fair skin. Um, and of course, uh, family history, if you, have, if you have somebody in your family, you are more likely to get it um, as well. Now, it's not completely genetic because there are those that uh, through their habits and, and lifestyle choices um, can also bring it on themselves. Smoking doubles your risk for having macular degeneration. Cardiovascular disease also help, uh, contributes. And we've learned within the last few years that blue light is what uh, it causes macular degeneration. So where do you, where, how do you get exposed to blue light? Obviously the sunlight about being outside, but also computer monitors, cell phones, iPads. Uh, these are all things that contribute to um, our, the blue light that we are exposed to. Now I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, read this, uh, but it's just really a, a very succinct way of describing macular degeneration. So macular degeneration is a common eye disease that is usually found in adults over the age of 60. However, with the use of smart devices such as laptops, cell phones, iPads, tablets, we are starting to see um, that this is becoming manifest in younger generations as well. So while some may not notice any symptoms during the early stages of the disease, um, macular degeneration can affect your central vision and there's no cure for macular degeneration. So current treatment is aimed at slowing down its progression. The treatment consists of supplements, um, and I'm sure you, you may have heard of those, and I'll go over those in very much, a great detail here in a bit. Uh, blue light filtering from glasses when you're indoors and on the computer and on, their, on your uh, smartphones. Um, sunglasses outdoors to help slow the progression. Uh, like most other diseases, there is no pain associated with macular degeneration. Uh, one of the best ways we can, um, that we diagnose it um, is through uh, imaging when you go to your optometrist's office or your ophthalmologist's practice. Um, using instruments such as the OCT, ocular coherence tomography is what that's called, fundus photos. Um, these are, it's always a good idea to get these tests done. Um, for me as, as an optometrist, when I look inside a person's eye and I'm using that, I'm at the slit lamp using that little uh, small uh, uh, lens that I'm trying to look in there, that, does, that gives me some view but it doesn't give me the best view. These extra images that we oftentimes recommend give us a much better view and we can diagnose them really, really much easily, more easily than I could through just looking through that uh, small opening in your pupil with that small lens. Uh, so those extra um, uh, uh, instruments can make a difference in catching it early. And a rather new instrument, by the way, that's on the scene um, that has, has really upped the ante is the, it's called the ADAPT-DX. And it's allowed us to adapt or to diagnose macular degeneration up to three years before the photos and the OCT allow us to see it, um, which is quite amazing. And what it does is it, it, it tests your ability to adapt to the dark environment. And I'll go over that in a little bit as well. Now, this is a, a picture of the uh, inside your eye. 
um, the yellow deposits within this is the is called drusen. This is macular degeneration. Uh, the very center part, where it's a little bit darker, that's where your macula is. Your, that's where your best vision is. In a cross-sectional view, and this is what the OCT image gives us, uh, we see um, down here the, the little bumps. This is in the pigment layer of your retina. And this little indentation here um, is where your macula is located. And so, of course, macula degener degeneration is right around the macula. Now, there's two types of macular degeneration. We've got dry and wet. With dry macular degeneration, it causes a gradual change in vision. So if people can have dry macular degeneration have 20-20 vision, and it ranges between 20-20 to 20-50 kind of vision. Um, and it's caused by drusen. Um, and by the way, the drusen is interesting. When they took drusen and they figured out what that is, it, 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 you, can, you can take that and put cholesterol right next to, next to it, and you can't tell the difference. It's the same substance. Um, so drusen is built up in the macula, uh, causing uh, the loss of vision. Now, the wet is when fluid starts to leak on, in the macula, um, and you have more of a sudden loss of vision. And they can take vision from the 2050 range to 2100, 2200 kind of range. Um, and so that's, that's a lot more um, debilitating in your central vision. Now, early macular degeneration. Okay, could potentially cause issues with reading and driving. Uh, you might notice the stray lines um, appear a little crooked um, and you have longer dark adaptation times, meaning it just takes a little longer for you to adapt to the dark. Doesn't mean you can't adapt to the dark, it just takes longer. Um, and then as we get into the advanced um, degeneration, you have that central blind spot. Now, your peripheral vision remains, it never goes, okay, when it's just macular degeneration, um, but, you do struggle and it's, it's frustrating when, when that comes on um, with respect to your central vision being lost because it's, it is more difficult to read and it's, it's frustrating uh, trying to, to read something and you can't see it. Uh, but there are places um, available here. I know, I know in Utah, uh, the, the state has a, a place set aside to help people with their independent living skills. Uh, and so it can be very beneficial to, to find those places and get uh, help if you're struggling with it. So my goal, um, as it relates to macular degeneration, is to have an early diagnosis, early treatment uh, implementation, and when needed, refer early to the retinal specialist where they can do injections and things like that when it hits that, that wet stage. But again, my goal is to make it so that hopefully you never even reach that stage of having wet macular degeneration. Um, so I monitor progression. Uh, I use, as I mentioned, the dark um, adaptation testing, the ADAPT-DX, and again, it can diagnose uh, the macular degeneration up to three years prior to showing up in the other uh, testing. Um, my office, I think, um, we used to be, I'm not sure if we're the only one now, but we used to be the only one that had the ADAPT-DX in our office from, from uh, Provo to, to Vegas. And so that's something that I, I, I think is important to, to do. And it, we use it also to monitor the progression. So if your, um, your ability to adapt to dark changes by more than two minutes or three minutes at a, uh, from one visit to the next, we know it's progressing faster. Um, and it helps us to keep track of it because as soon as it starts changing from that dry to wet, we want you to get you to that retinal specialist to help retain your vision as, as long as possible. Um, I use the other instruments as I mentioned, the photos and OCT imaging. Uh, we use central 10 degree visual field since it's your central vision we're working at. Um, and of course, you may or may send you home with what's called an AMSA grid uh, to monitor on your own as well. Now, as far as um, what foods can you eat that would be beneficial here? So foods rich in lutein and zeaxanthin, dark green leafy vegetables, dark red and blueberries, egg yolk. These are things that, that have those in them. Um, there, there, there are supplements you can take um, that contain antioxidants. There is a study called the ARED study um, that was done back in 2001 and then repeated in, in 20, uh, 2006. Um, and, and these supplements have been shown to lower the risk of getting macular degeneration. And we'll go over that a little bit uh, in more depth as well. You can wear sunglasses when you're outdoors, wear blue filtered lenses when you're indoors on the computers and things. Stop smoking if you smoke, or better yet, don't start smoking. Uh, control your, um, you know, any, any cardiovascular disease. Um, and of course, when we do reach that 
that wet stage, uh, get those injections to help bring that, you know, minimize that fluid to help retain your vision as long as you can. So going and talking about the age-related eye disease study in 2001, um, the, the age-related eye disease study um, was set up um, to try to um, see if it would, it would make a difference for those people who had wet macular degeneration, if they took high doses of supplements. And those high doses of the supplements included uh, vitamin A, uh, vitamin C, E, zinc, and copper. Um, and then they repeated that study in 2006 because they realized there were some things happening. I'll go over that with you. Uh, um, and so they started a new study called ARIDS2. And, they, and, and so what I wanna do is go over what and why they made those changes. So in the first study, um, it was interesting as they went through the process of, of uh, trying to determine if, if uh, it was beneficial or not. Uh, they were studying, um, there are certain people who are starting to get lung cancer and they traced it back to high doses of vitamin A combined with the history of smoking or, 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 or still smoking. And so they realized that with so many smokers uh, having macular degeneration, that was not going to work um, because obviously it's going to cause more harm than good. Um, they also learned that uh, there were some, some issues with the zinc. Um, so when you have high doses of zinc, uh, during that time frame um, between the first study and the second study, um, there is some information showing that, that zinc may be associated with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so that was a concern. So in the second study, uh, what they did is they took out vitamin A or beta carotene. They decreased the amount of zinc from 80 milligrams to 25 milligrams. And of course, it's, copper is not even needed if there's no zinc because the copper is just there because of the side effects of the zinc. And, and they also added in omega-3 fatty acids um, and, they, and they changed the vitamin A to lutein and zeaxanthin. And so these are pretty substantial changes uh, with respect to the study. And, you know, interestingly, um, let me grab my notes on this one. But when they changed out, the, were in the first study, I believe they lowered the risk for, um, yeah, by 25%, they lowered the risk over a five year period by 25% for um, the risk of advanced macular degeneration just from taking these supplements. And when they did the second study, they actually got a little bit slightly better result, just not statistically so. And, and so that was kind of an interesting uh, statement. Um, so I'm gonna talk about MacuHope because that's what I actually recommend for supplements. Um, I've kind of pushed away from the AREDS formula because of the zinc that they have included in it, um, because basically of the association with Alzheimer's. Um, with zinc. Now, an interesting little fact, um, during that st second study, they actually took um, a genetic, uh, they took um, um, basically they, they, they went through it and took, um, uh, give me a second. They took genetic samples uh, of the people that were in the study and after the study, they went back and found, and, and during the study, they actually found that a third of those taking the zinc um, actually had their macular degeneration progress faster, not slower. And when they went back and studied the genetic samples, uh, they, they found that one third of those taking zinc shouldn't take it because of their genetic makeup. Uh, and the problem here is that you don't know necessarily if you have that genetic predisposition uh, that you should or should not take zinc. Um, and so, and I used to, when I first um, started uh, testing for macular degeneration, um, I would actually have those patients that I found um, signs of, of macular de degeneration do a genetic test. Um, but over the years, I've decided that, that rather than go through the expense of doing that, um, macular health was a better option because it just avoided the issue of zinc altogether. So I'm gonna go down a little uh, rabbit hole here, if you will, with respect to um, macular degeneration and, and the supplements associated with it. Um, so 
the effects of macular degeneration on the eye, brain, and body. Um, this this is a study by Jim Stringham, uh, and and he came out and presented to the Utah Optometric Association in 2021, uh, actually here in St. George, out of Tuacon. Um, and he, he had been a professor at Duke University for a number of years, and he was transitioning over and actually going to work for um, the, the company Mackey Health. Um, and so I reached out to him and asked him if I could use his slides, and he gave me his, his approval. Uh, so these next few slides are going to be based on, on his. So many of us uh, may not understand or recognize the term carotenoid. Uh, we, we, we may have heard of lutein and zeaxanthin, but we don't know what it is. But most of us understand what beta carotene is. It comes from vitamin A. And so carotenoids basically are pigments that give fruits and vegetables their color. So beta carotene gives carrots the orange color. Um, the the um, lutein and zeaxanthin um, are kind of a yellowish um, coloration. They're found in dark green leafy vegetables, dark red and berries, egg yolks, um, and they are antioxidants. So lutein and zeaxanthin, actually, when they're when they um, are when you look at them in the in the retina, and you can see here. Um, in the macular region here, uh, this it's kind of a yellowish coloration. That's the lutein and zeaxanthin right there in the macula. Um, and so it's really important uh, pigment uh, that that collects there. I'm just catching up on my notes here to make sure I'm not missing anything. Okay, so on this slide, we're seeing that in Japan, they have about 10 times the amount of macular pigment, um, the lutein and zeaxanthin and whatnot, in their retinas than we do here as adults in, in the United States. So why are uh, macular, why is macular pigment so low in the U.S. population? Uh, it doesn't take a scientist to figure out that our diets have a lot to control this. Uh, it, I mean, I, I look at my own children and what they eat. Mac and cheese, hot dogs, chicken nuggets, french fries. I mean, that's what I feed them. Um, then that's what I tend to eat also because that's what I feed them. So is there any question why we have such a, a low uh, of macular pigment? Um, and of course, Japanese, they eat... Uh, more dark green leafy vegetables in their diets than we do. Now, there's other things that can also contribute to why we have such a low macular pigment. Um, and this information, this slide shows that, it, um, and this is data from the USDA, but in 1953, a bowl of spinach had the same nutritional content as in the year 2000, 43 bowls of spinach do. Okay, so a lot of the nutrients have been lost through the years in the foods we eat. And so that plays a role in why we have such a nutrient deficient um, diet and why we don't have the macular pigments um, like other people do as adults here in the United States. Now, this is a, an interesting study. Um, so a group of researchers had some rhesus monkeys and with one set of rhesus monkeys, they gave them um, lutein and zeaxanthin and the other set, they, they made sure they didn't get any lutein and zeaxanthin. And if you look on the, on the left in, in, in the box A, you can see that, that retina looks pristine. It looks perfect. If you look in, in, in the box B there and you can see macular degeneration um, starting up in those devoid of any lutein or zeaxanthin in their, in their diet. So early diet matters. Now macular pigment, okay, um, can be absorbed. They can absorb the, the blue light. So just like when you were outside in the sun, you got sunglasses on and it filters out that blue light from getting into your eyes quite a bit. Not all of it does. And so there's still some blue light that can get through and the macular pigment in your retina can filter out 
that blue light so it doesn't cause as much damage. So it's important to have that macular pigment to protect your eyes from macular degeneration. Uh, this is a, another interesting um, study. Um, so we, we, we can see from these two studies that uh, we can actually um, affect our risk for AMD for macular degeneration by taking these carotenoids. Uh, so we have, there's a 43% less risk for AMD uh, when you um, take um, the carotenoids, uh, lutein and zeaxanthin. And there's also an interesting, uh, the one to the side there, um, there is an interesting study that um, for women, older women who are, um, have basically, well, let me again look at my notes here so I make sure I get this right. So basically lifestyle impacts are risk. So women in the highest quintile of physical activity had 54% lower odds for early macular degeneration. And in fact, having a combination of three healthy behaviors, healthy diet, physical activity, and not smoking was associated with 71% lower odds for macular degeneration. So I think I'm, I'm maybe speaking to the choir here, those that are you know, physically active. Uh, so I think that's great because you know that you're on the right, um, you're doing the right things in your life to minimize your risk. This is another interesting slide here and I'll just try to describe it. Um, but it's interesting to note that the timing and the location of where lutein is located in the eye um, as the fetus develops, um, this, so as, you're, as the fetus is developing, the highest concentration of lutein is found in the vitreous humor. That's the gel substance inside your eye. And then as the retina begins to develop, it's interesting that the highest concentration of lutein is found in the retina. And these are different as, a, as the fetus progresses. Then, it's an, it, so, so in, in case you're not aware, by the way, um, the retina in the eye um, comes from the same place in the fetus as the brain does. So it comes from the same basic tissue. And I think that's important to, to keep in mind also. Now, this is an interesting slide also. There's uh, about 50 different um, carotenoids found in the foods and vegetables we eat. About 20 of them are found in the blood serum. And only lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesial zeaxanthin are found in the eye with concentration of over 1,000 times that's found in the, in the blood serum. Um, and so I think that's kind of an interesting little fact. And lutein and zeaxanthin are also found in the brain. In fact, lutein is one of those carotenoids that can go through the blood-brain barrier. And I think that's important to be aware of. So after a baby's born, why is colostrum yellow? Okay. That's, um, could, it, could it possibly be because of high concentration of lutein in the colostrum? Um, and of course, that's what we find to be the case. So compared to later milk produced by the mother, colostrum contains a higher concentration of lutein right when the baby needs that the most in the brain development. So what stage of development do, we, do you think we'll find the highest concentration of lutein in the brain? Um, this graph shows that it's after birth, because again, that's when the brain is going through its highest uh, time of development. And here is, um, it shows that between the age of, of, of birth and one year of age, lutein comprises the highest concentration of carotenoid within the brain, and by a big difference compared to the other uh, carotenoids. This pie chart here um, shows the, the difference between a, the amount of lutein concentration in an infant brain, and as we get older, the, the amount of lutein we have in in our, an adult brain. And we can see 58% of the carotenoid in the lymphoid brain, whereas it's only 34% in the adult brain. Um, and if you combine the, the uh, lutein and zeaxanthin, uh, that's a whopping 74% of the carotenoid in the, in the infant brain. Um, so again, again, that's important. 
um, because the carotenoids are what's providing protection, um, uh, not only to the retina, but potentially to the brain as well as it's needed. So if, if lutein is found in high concentrations in the retina and also in the brain, particularly being um, during the critical development time periods, uh, and given that the brain and the retina are derived from the same tissue in the fetus, and then given that our lack of lutein zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin as we um, age contributes to age-related macular degeneration, and given that there seems to be a similar high degree of dementia, particularly Alzheimer's disease as we age, and the fact that our adult diets are low in lutein zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin, could there possibly be a connection? So in 2008, this study came out showing that 12 milligrams of lutein and or 800 milligrams of DHA uh, omega-3s improved memory scores, verbal fluency, and rate of learning. And this was done in, in older women. And then in uh, 2018, John Nolan in this study suggested that for patients with Alzheimer's disease who consumed a combination of 10 milligrams of lutein 10 milligrams of mesozeaxanthin and two milligrams of zeaxanthin a day. That's, by the way, those are, that's what MacuHealth is. Um, plus 430 milligrams of DHA and 90 milligrams of EPA fish oils for 18 months had a positive outcome and caregivers reported uh, functional memory, sight, and mood benefits. Now, I, as I, when I asked Jim Stringham for, for permission to use the slides, he mentioned to me that he had just reviewed a, a study um, that, that and is a placebo-controlled trial in Alzheimer's disease patients that used macular carotenoids and fish oils for a year. And he said they showed stabilizing effects of the disease. Uh, and, and, and I think this is exciting um, uh, and it's, it's supportive of the other studies that have been going on. Um, he did actually a study in 2019 um, that in young adults, uh, age 18 to 25, where he had them taking the lutein, zeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin for six months. Um, and he said the cognitive scores are the measures of scores of, com of composite memory, verbal memory, sustained attention, psychomotor speed, and processing speed all improved significantly in the treatment groups, whereas those in placebo group remained unchanged. So I think we have um, some, some, in some good information about lutein. Um, uh, and zeaxanthin that, that can be very beneficial, uh, not just to the eye, but for the brain as well as we age. Uh, with this, with this uh, study, this next one here, this again is one done by Jim uh, Stringham. He did a, a macular carotenoids and visual performance in sports study. And of course, the World Senior Games athletes, uh, I think you might appreciate this. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this study, but I will give you the results. And so it was found that macular pigments such as lutein and zeaxanthin play a key role in our ability to perform both or statically, uh, what we measure as visual acuity, uh, and dynamically, how fast we can react when we see something. It's important to understand that visual acuity uh, is only one aspect of visual performance. Other aspects include contrast sensitivity, being able to discern items um, in low light levels, okay, mm -hmm. and speed processing visual signals, uh, such as um, our, something that could affect our timing, our hand-eye coordination, and reaction time. So any sport uh, which relies on visual input can benefit from supplementing diet with macular pigments of lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin, and that applies to pretty much any sport. Okay, so to sum up, these are some of the benefits then of taking macular supplements. Better visual quality, better day and night driving vision, better blue light protection, better cognition, cognition, um, comprehension, uh, and, and, and mental uh, brain function, better sports vision, and better sleep and less stress. Okay. So on to glaucoma. So glaucoma, is the second common most cause of vision loss in the elderly. It affects 10% of African Americans over 70 and 2% of Caucasians over 70. And this is one of those diseases that's completely detectable and preventable. Uh, it's important to get your eyes uh, checked on a, on a regular basis. 
um, because this one's completely, um, it can eliminate a lot of blindness that's happening. So what is glaucoma? People of all ages can be diagnosed with glaucoma. So it's not just an age thing. It does happen with younger ages as well, but it's just more common as we get older. Uh, like macular degeneration, this disease has um, no symptoms until vision is affected uh, in its slight stages. This disease damages the optic nerve and can lead to full blindness if not treated early. These treatments usually involve using eye drops to lower the pressure in the eyes. There are quite a few different types of glaucoma also. High eye pressure or ocular hypertension can be very indicative of glaucoma. Other telltale signs may include cl um, a closed outflow angle in the anterior part of the eye where the, where the fluid um, tries to get out and go back into the blood supply. It's not able to as well as it should. And so the pressure can go up or you could be producing too much um, fluid. Um, and of course, that can cause uh, thinning of the nerve fibers in the back of the eye, uh, where the nerve fibers are entering into the optic disc to exit back to the eye to go to the brain. Uh, since the symptoms often go unnoticed, getting regular eye exams is, is the best preventative measure to protect yourself from vision loss of this disease. Um, the, as I mentioned earlier, imaging from high-tech instruments allow us to diagnose and manage glaucoma. If you have not opted into receiving those um, further imaging uh, in your previous exams, highly, I highly recommend doing so in your next exam to get a baseline and potentially catch any of the early uh, signs of this disease. And with, with respect to this, um, glaucoma is known as the, the silent thief of sight for a reason. Because when you do have vision loss, um, it typically is more pronounced in one eye than the, than the other eye. And so the good eye kind of makes up the difference. So you don't notice that vision loss. And that's again, why it's important to get it checked uh, by your eye doctor. So what are some of the risk factors that, that uh, we're looking for when you come in? High eye pressure is one of those risk factors. Um, if you're African, um, uh, if you have half African racial heritage, that's a risk factor, advanced age. Uh, family history of glaucoma. So if someone in your family has it, you're likely to get it. High blood pressure, diabetes, and of myopia of all things, who would have thought, right? But being nearsighted is a risk factor. Now, this is um, an image of the optic nerve. This is the right eye on the left and the left eye on the right that we're looking at. Um, and as you look at this image, um, I want you to kind of pay attention to that kind of the pale, um, lighter color in the center versus the orangish ring. That orangish ring we call the rim tissue. Um, and the, the lighter area is where there is no tissue. So think of this like a donut, okay? If you, if you had a donut that had very little donut and a really huge donut hole, you feel like you got chipped off uh, with that, with that uh, when you bought that donut. You'd be like, where's my donut? Well, the same thing goes here with your optic nerve. If you have very thin rim tissue on the outside and very little substance in the middle, um, that's one of the really big risk factors for having glaucoma. And so I wanted to show that to you just so you can kind of get a sense for what it looks like. This, this next image is a printout that I get when I do use the OCT instrument. And you might notice here um, on, on the uh, left-hand side is the, is the printout for the right eye. Um, and it's the same photo that we just saw. Um, with the with the OCT imaging here next to it, the same eye, and down below you see that that kind of that red going off down to the um, the lower left, that is indicating that there is a thinning of the rib, the the nerve fibers as they are entering into the optic nerve. Likewise, on the other side of the left eye, we can see it on the lower right uh, uh, quadrant there of that image, where we see the thinning of the nerve fibers, and so that's pretty um, pretty obvious that we have some uh, some glaucoma, some loss of those of that rim tissue. Down below, you can see uh, a cross-sectional view of the optic nerve uh, where, where that uh, cupping is what we call it, um, where we have that, that loss of, of, of tissue, uh, where it kind of looks like a cup, cup in position in the green um, area in the dark area. And so this is what I look at when I uh, evaluate uh, glaucoma with, with an OCT instrument. There are different types of glaucoma, as I mentioned. There's primary open angle glaucoma, which is the most common type in the elderly. There's angle closure glaucoma. There's normal tension glaucoma. So you can actually have normal pressures and still have glaucoma. Again, high eye pressure is just a risk factor. Uh, there can be normal pressures and still have glaucoma. Not as common as the primary open angle glaucoma, but it can still occur. 
Um, right now, I'm going to just concentrate my remarks on the open angle glaucoma. So right now, um, what we're seeing here is the the process of, of uh, fluid being produced um, through um, through the uh, uh, muscles. Um, you've got the the blood supply coming through here, and we get fluid that comes out that um, the the clear fluid from the blood supply comes through here, gives nutrition uh, to the anterior part of the the eyeball. It, it um, goes between the lens and the pupil, and it, and it enters into the uh, anterior chamber of the eye. Um, it circulates around there, and when it decides it's done giving nutrition to the eye, it goes out through um, uh, the the filtering system back into the blood supply. Um, there in the angle, and you see the cornea and the iris that makes up the angle. Uh, what can happen then if there's too much fluid being produced, um, or not enough fluid? The fluid is getting blocked, so it can't get out. Then the the pressure will build up within the eye, and over time it radiates back. And of course, the weak link is where the optic nerve exits out the back of the eye. And so as the, as the pressure builds up, it puts pressure on those nerve fibers, which causes those nerve fibers to uh, slowly uh, thin out and die off. And of course, once they're gone, they're gone. And each, um, each nerve fiber correlates with a photoreceptor, which correlates with a point in your visual space that you perceive. And so if you've lost that, if you've lost that uh, nerve fiber, you've essentially lost that photoreceptor, which essentially you've lost that visual field where that um, correlates to in your, in your field of vision. Um, and so that's how that works. So what do we do? How do we treat uh, for glaucoma? Um, first of all, the goal here with glaucoma treatment is to prevent further optic nerve damage, halt that vision, that visual field loss. Um, and we start with eye drops to lower the pressures. Even in, in people that have normal pressures that have glaucoma, we still use eye drops, try to get the pressure lower. Um, if, if that um, doesn't work, surgery is an option um, to help lower the pressure as well. And of course, we want to monitor it. So just once, you know, just because you're on the drops doesn't mean that things can't change. Um, there's times when people are on the drops, things are going well, and then it just stops working. And so we need to change up the treatment pattern. Um, and so we, do, we figure that out through monitoring, making sure that we're not having continued visual field loss, making sure the pressures are down. Um, and we do that through visual fields and OCT. I actually use a color vision test also because that kind of gives me an extra little uh, input to see if, if the, um, your, your, visual, um, your visual functioning is affected as well. So now on to uh, age-related cataracts. So this is the most common cause of vision loss in the elderly. Um, in the Framingham Eye uh, study, uh, it indicated that people that were 65 to 74 years old, 18% of them had cataracts. And of course, as we age 75 to 85 years old, 46% get cataracts. And here's a, an example of a cataract. And you know, I've, get, I've got this question from many people over the years, you know, is the cataract on the outside of my eye? No, the cataract is actually internal. It's where the, the lenticular, the, the lens is that focuses your, your, your vision for up close. Um, that's, it's located there. Most um, cataracts are due to age-related changes of the lens. Um, and of course, UV light uh, from sunlight uh, is a huge contributor to that. There are other um, reasons why people may get cataracts, different types of cataracts, diabetes, uh, medications we may take, corticosteroids, Injections, um, things like that. Uh, when our when our knees are giving us pain and we, we need that pain to go away, we don't get a, a steroid shot. Um, other medications may cause cataracts also. Smoking increases your your risk for getting cataracts. Alcohol use, um, and of course, nutritional deficiency may be contributing as well. And so, what are the symptoms? Um, as you can see here, you're just blurred, hazy, cloudy vision. Uh, reduced intensity to color. Interestingly, when people get cataract surgery and they have cataract surgery, uh, one of the first things they say is they're amazed at how, 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 how much more colorful things are that they missed out on because over the course of their lifetime, they've slowly lost that, that ability to see color as well because of the cataract coming on. Um, it, it can also cause increased sensitivity uh, from glare, especially at nighttime when you're driving, um, increased difficulty seeing at night, and it can cause, um, cause you to see double or multiple images. Now, cataracts don't have to be scary. 
these are different types of cataracts, by the way. The one on the upper left is a nuclear sclerotic cataract. The one on the right, upper right, is a posterior subcapsular cataract. And the one on the bottom is a cortical cataract. Um, and so, so again, but they don't have to be scary. In fact, um, there's cataracts are easy to treat. Um, of course, their, their, their size, location determine um, how much they affect your vision. Um, when someone comes in and they, and they ask me, you know, how are my cataracts? I have a scale of one to four. One is mild, two is moderate, three it's time for surgery, four it's past time for surgery. We don't ever want anybody to get to that stage four. And if you're having routine exams, eye, eye exams, you should never get to that, that sample, that size or, or stage four. Uh, because when, if you get to that point, it makes it more difficult for the surgeon. Um, it complicates the surgery and there's, there's more chance for uh, having uh, poor outcomes. And so if we can catch it at the stage three, that's the best. Um, and that's typically when vision starts to go downhill a little bit, uh, where, you know, instead of 2020 vision, you're getting 2030 or 2040 vision. Um, so surgery is indicated for two reasons. If, if I'm, as a doctor, I'm saying, hey, you look, it's time for surgery. Uh, there's a significant um, amount of cataract here and you're not getting good vision on your, on your, your testing today. We should be looking at doing cataract, sur cataract surgery because glasses are just not going to fix the problem. Um, or you may come in and say, hey, doc, I'm just, I can't see well at night when I'm driving, or I can't read very well anymore. Is there, is there something that can be done? And I look inside your eye, and you're like, sure enough, um, that cataract, even though I wouldn't have otherwise thought it would be contributing, it may well be contributing to the reason why you're not seeing well. And so, so if, so surgery basically is indicated if there's, if it's interfering with some aspect of your lifestyle. Um, and that has to come from you as the patient, um, as opposed from the doctor. Um, there is no medication, no medical treatment, medication wise that will resolve the cataract. It's, it has to be done by surgery. On to diabetic retinopathy. So this is the fourth most common cause of vision loss in the elderly. Um, type two diabetes is more common in, as you get older um, than type one. And macular edema or swelling of the, of the macula is more common in type two. So let's go through what diabetic retinopathy is. It's another leading cause of vision loss among adults. Uh, when someone has diabetes, it's with a, or with, when someone with diabetes experiences high levels of blood sugar, the blood vessels in the retina can become damaged and vision can be compromised. There are two main stages of diabetic eye disease. The first is non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy or, NPR, or NPDR for short. This is the early stage of diabetic eye disease. With NPDR, tiny blood vessels leak which makes the, the retina swell. When the macula swells, it's called macular edema. This is the most common reason why people with diabetes lose their vision. The other stage of the diabetic eye disease is proliferative diabetic retinopathy or PDR. Now PDR is a more advanced stage. It happens when the retina starts growing new blood vessels. This is called neovascularization. And PDR is very serious and can take both your central and peripheral, peripheral vision. Uh, there are treatment options for diabetic retinopathy. Uh, the biggest one, is controlling your blood sugar and blood pressure. Okay, that can actually stop your vision loss. Um, and I want to repeat that. So controlling your blood sugar is your biggest um, way of stopping diabetic retinopathy. And there are also medications that can help reduce the swelling of the macula, uh, which can slow vision loss. Um, if you have been diagnosed, diagnosed with diabetes, it's recommended to have a dilated eye exam yearly to check for potential signs of the diabetic retinopathy. Um, one of the things I learned as a student is that if someone has diabetes, it typically takes about 10 years of uncontrolled diabetes for it to show up in the eye. And so as long as it's controlled, great. Uh, we don't oftentimes see it in the eye if it's controlled. However, how long has it been, you know, how long have you had diabetes before you, you got it diagnosed? There's probably several years there where, where it was uncontrolled. And so that's something to consider. So again, risk factors for diabetic retinopathy, obviously diabetes, type one and type two. As I mentioned earlier, the longer you have the diabetes, the more likely it's going to, you're going to have um, to develop it in the eye as diabetic retinopathy, especially if it's uncontrolled. Hispanics and African-Americans um, are more at risk and um, other risk factors include um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and of course, pregnancy can cause gestational diabetes. So some of the symptoms, seeing spots or floaters in your field of vision, blurred vision. Uh, by the way, 
uh, with diabetes, if your blood sugar is not controlled, it can affect your, your, how well your, your glasses are working. So what can happen is you get an accumulation of fluid in the crystal lens uh, due to prolonged periods of high blood sugars, and it changes your prescription. And so, in fact, I've, I've, I've talked to people that, that have had uh, visual changes from morning to afternoon to evening because of the blood sugar changes. Um, and so their vision changes along with that. It can also cause a diabetic cataract. Um, now other symptoms include a dark or an empty spot in the center of your vision, difficulty again seeing well at night, and untreated diabetic retinopathy can cause blindness. Here's an example of those um, new vessels, the neovascularization that I mentioned to you before. Uh, these are weak vessels and they can break and the bleeding occurs in the vitreous. Um, and of course that will cause loss of vision. You also see some other um, telltale signs of the diabetes, little hemorrhages in the retina. We call them dot blot hemorrhages. Uh, that shows up with the initial um, diabetic retinopathy. Um, and there's various stages that are associated with that. And greater um, loss, of, uh, or greater um, uh, bleeding can occur underneath the retina. Um, and that's where that proliferative diabetic retinopathy uh, plays out. This image here is a, this, this white or yellow substance surrounding the macula is called exudate. That is an indication that there's swelling or, or macular edema going on. Um, so that's, that's what that looks like. Okay, on to dry eye disease. So some of the symptoms for dry eye include discomfort, irritation, grittiness, burning, dryness, heaviness, tired eyes, watering eyes. Uh, a lot of people are like, how can my eyes be dry if it's watering? Uh, but that is one of the symptoms. Light sensitivity, pain, um, especially uh, like a kind of stabbing pain on your, on your, on your cornea, um, blurring or unstable vision. And then of course there's aesthetic issues where your eyes are red all the time because of chronic redness because of the dry eyes. And of course your quality of life um, can be impacted from dry eyes, uh, psych psychologically can be impacted. Um, uh, my, my, my niece, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about her story. She was going to the, the University of Utah uh, to, to do, get her degree, and she nearly dropped out of school because of her dry eye issue. Fortunately, she was able to uh, get the help she needed, and she just recently graduated with her master's. Uh, but people are greatly impacted with, with dry eyes. Um, many of us don't quite comprehend it, even if we have a little bit of the symptoms, but it can progress, and it can, be, can change your life. Um, and there are many people who are terrified of eventually going blind because of the dry eye. So what is dry eye disease? Now, there was a group of, of uh, influential um, optometrists and ophthalmologists that got together and came together with a definition for what dry eye disease is. Uh, Dr. Art Epstein um, is a um, very influential um, uh, optometrist in, in the country. Um, and this is his twist on that definition that they came up with, that dry eye is a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface characterized by a loss of homeostasis of the tear film in the ocular surface and accompanied by ocular symptoms in which tear film instability and hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation damage, and neurosensory and neuroeffector abnormalities may play ideological roles. Did you catch that? Kind of complicated. Even for me as an eye doctor who should understand all that, and I, I feel like I do, but I have to go you know, step by step to figure it out. That's kind of difficult to figure out. That's it's complicated. So why is dry eyes so insanely complex? Um, first off, there's, there's different ways to approach uh, dry eye. Uh, you could look at it as a tear component-based approach uh, is, is, is you either have tears or you don't have tears. Uh, and it's because of lack of tear production or it's evaporating or a combination of the two. There's the meibomian gland dysfunction approach. Um, the meibomian glands are oil glands um, that can, can get clogged up and plugged up. And so they're, they're affecting whether your tears are functioning right. Uh, there's the, the tear or ocular surface dysfunction approach. Um, there's tear instability, loss of surface protection on the eye. And then of course, inflammation that can come through because of the dys dysfunction can result in dry eye. There's alteration of the, of the microbiome, meaning we have bacteria on our lids, on our, on our lids and our skin and when you get a buildup of the back of the of the, of the uh, bacteria uh, and mites, that can affect uh, dry eye as well. 
And then there's just plain primary inf inflammatory disease that systemically occurs that can affect dry eye. And then of course, you've got the homeostatic control failure, meaning if something goes wrong, something else has to, to make up the difference. And eventually, um, because you can't maintain the homeostasis of the, of the tears, you've got dry eye because of that failure. And then there's the neurosensory or neuroeffector um, dysfunction, um, where it's related to the nerves and how that uh, contributes to dry eye. So there, it's extremely complex. And when someone comes in and they, they have symptoms of dry eye, we've got to figure out as the eye doctor what's going on and figure out what's the best way to treat. And uh, going back, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, you'd go to the eye doctor and they'd say, yeah, just grab some eye drops and, and they wouldn't tell you which ones to get. You just go get some eye drops from the, you know, over the counter and use that. Um, and, and unfortunately that didn't solve the problem. Um, and we're finding that the, the dry eye disease is a whole lot more complex than just a simple um, artificial tear to resolve it. So let's go through the structure of the anterior part of the eye. The, eye. Um, the cornea, start with the cornea. The corneal surface is not smooth. Um, it's actually made of a tiny microvilli or finger-like projections. Without tears, you would not have a smooth surface or, um, for light to pass through, uh, which would result in blurry vision. And so the, Again, you need those tears to, to uh, give you the smooth surface for the light to get through. Um, and the tears are composed of three layers, mucus, aqueous, and lipid. Uh, the, the lids also act to smooth the tears out over the surface of the eye, kind of like your windshield wiper. Okay, your lids do the same thing. They, they, they clear that up. Uh, so you have a clear, smooth surface to look through. So, so let's talk tears for just a moment here. Um, so you have a... You have the goblet cells in the in the whites of your eyes, conjunctiva, that produce the mucus layer of the tears. And the lacrimal gland actually produces the aqueous or the watery layer. And then the uh, meibomian glands that are um, within the, the lids, the top and the bottom lids, they produce the oils or the mybo that stabilize the tears. So if you think of it like a, 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 a um, building, your, your mucus layer is the foundation and the aqueous layer is the walls, the lipid layer is the roof. And if there's anything that goes wrong with either of any of those layers, uh, you're going to have a dry eye problem. So it's more of a, 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 a dysfunctional tear film if you have issues there. Um, now I'm going to, I kind of already went through this, so I'm going to go to the next slide. So my bone gland dysfunction, we're going to talk about the lids first here and how they may be playing a role. Um, because it's, it's actually kind of an important part uh, of, of your, of your um, being able to see clearly and function without dry eye. But if any of you sleep with your eyes sl slightly open or um, any complete closure at nighttime called noctur nocturnal ophthalmos, um, that can result in dry eye problems. So if you're waking up um, in the morning and your eyes are hurting and burning, uh, you probably are sleeping with your eyes partly open. If you want to find out for sure, just have one of your family members watch you as you sleep, right? They can check and see if there's a slip opening there, because if it is, uh, you're, you're going to have problems in the morning when you wake up. It often runs in families. Um, I've got that problem myself. All my children have it. Um, and so there's things you can do, though, to help out. Um, I, used to, um, I used to grab an artificial tear every morning when I woke up just to relieve that burning that I, that I felt when I woke up. I no longer do that because of other issues, reasons, um, because of other treatments I've been doing. Um, but... Uh, those are uh, uh, common things that occur. Uh, less frequent blinking. So this is an important one. When we're on computers, okay, it's actually been studied that we don't blink as often. And so if we're, if we're not blinking as often, guess what's gonna happen? Our, our tears are gonna, um, they're, gonna, they're gonna evaporate and we're gonna have dry eye problems. Uh, incomplete blink. Now here's an important one too. So. In order for you to get oils on your into your tears, your lids actually have to blink. Okay, so when they meet, they exert that they they cause that that oil to to just a little bit to come out into the tears, and that oil is what helps stabilize the tears. Um, if if you don't blink completely, okay, so if you if your lids don't meet, those oils don't get out into the tears and they get stuck in the in, in the glands, and when they get stuck in the glands, they become clogged, stagnant, they turn rancid. And that causes the glands to atrophy and die off. This is caused by myobian gland, called myobian gland dysfunction, um, and that's a, that's an important thing to remember as well. 
So here's, here's a, a grading system of the glands. And you can see here um, in the top part here where the oil glands, this is, by the way, this is called mybography. This is a, a way for us to um, um, image the oil glands in your lids. And it helps us to see if, if they're present or not. Um, in the first one, that's, that's considered normal, um, where all the glands are present. And then you can see as we go to grade one, where you start to see some, some uh, atrophy of the glands on the sides and some truncation of some of the other glands there to the other side. As we get to the moderate stage, we see there's more truncation and more, more atrophy. And then when we get to the spare stage, there's very few glands left. These glands don't come back. Okay, it's very difficult to get them to come back if they do. And so if someone loses all their oil glands, they're gonna have dry eye problems. Uh, down to the lower section here, we're seeing um, as uh, the effort to express, and you see um, some kind of clear oils coming out on that first one where, where the oils um, in the glands there, um, you kind of see the reflection of the, the oils there on the lead surface. And the second one, there's some cloudy um, oils coming out. That's not a good indication. That means those glands are clogged up. And then the third, it's starting to come out more like a toothpaste appearance. That's, that's not good either. So they're really clogged up in there and they need to get out. If they're clogged up, they're not getting to the tear, into the tear film either. Now, worse yet is if there's nothing that comes out. So on the last one, when, when, the, dot, when the optometrist goes through and tries to, to check to see if there's any oils that can come out, if they're not coming out at all, guess what's the possibility? Either you've lost your glands or they're so clogged up that nothing's coming out and, and treatment is needed. So there's other things, as I mentioned earlier, that can cause uh, dry eye and gland dysfunction. A biofilm buildup, okay? So we have the normal bacteria on our lids and lashes that begin to flourish, they overpopulate. Mites also can, that, uh, that are living in the follicles where lashes become abundant. Um, not a very pleasant thought, I get it, um, but that happens and it's common. Um, and what happens when that happens is, is we have oil, the oil glands become clogged again, stagnant, turn rancid, and cause the glands to atrophy and die off. Um, and inflammation results, okay? Um, over to the side here, I've got some, some uh, the yellowing there indicates the, the biofilm buildup on the lids and lashes. And then down here to, below, we see the stages of, of uh, an inflamed eye, okay? From grade zero all the, way up to, well, all the way to grade four. The most common that I see is grade one to grade two. Um, I, I don't frequently see the grade three and grade four. Um, but the common ones are grade one, grade two. But what can cause the inflammation? Um, aging, dusty, um, dry conditions, windy climate, insufficient blinking, as I mentioned earlier, alterations in diet. So we're not getting the omega-3s in our diet like we need to, to help out. And by the way, omega-3s can be a huge um, help uh, with, with every part of the body that is part of the mucous membrane um, from dry throat to dry mouth to, to the, the, the eyes. Uh, they can help out with that. Um, and we also, um, from other studies, know that, that omega-3s help with the heart. And, and so those are good to take. Um, Long-term contact lens wear can contribute to inflammation. Uh, medication side effects, okay, glaucoma medications, unfortunately, can cause dry eye. Um, eye surgeries can cause dry eye. LASIK, okay, is a common cause of dry eye. And of course, um, my, uh, my woman gland dysfunction um, results in lipid insufficiency and that drives and exacerbates uh, virtually all dry eye, regardless of her, if it's uh, caused by lack of, of, of uh, tear production or if it's due to uh, stagnation of the glands themselves. And another cause of, of my woman gland dysfunction is neurogenic. As I mentioned earlier, um, this could be one of those causes. So it's kind of a wiring problem, if you will. Um, going back to the example of LASIK, okay, when, when surgeons um, um, do LASIK, they sever the corneal nerves uh, when they make the flap to do the surgery. And when they come back, uh, when they put that flap back down, it takes a while for those corneal, corneal nerves to grow back. And sometimes they don't grow back, and sometimes they grow back incorrectly. And that can result in dry eye problems. And again, an example of a neurogenic problem. And as you can see here in this, in this um, schematic, the oculars, you know, it's, it's under central control, the dry eye, uh, the, 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 the tears are. 
Um, now, the prevalence of, of, of meibomian gland dysfunction uh, is, is a good reason to have mybography uh, done. Um, dry eye is, again, as I said before, it's complex, it's chronic disease, um, and it's essential to identify the underlying cause of each patient's dry eye and treat that underlying cause, not just use an artificial tear. Um, in fact, artificial tears, although they may provide a momentary um, relief, uh, they, don't, they don't treat the underlying cause. It's like a Band-Aid, okay? And so, so it might help a little bit, but it's not going to get to the underlying cause to, to really uh, resolve the issue. Um, so mybography is critical for several reasons. First, the initial diagnosis, trying to figure out what the underlying cause is, trying to uh, uh, determine the severity and, and how to stage treatment. Um, what is the most appropriate treatment? Um, how is that mybum oil? How's, how, how, much, how much oil is there? And what's the quality of the, in the tears? Uh, it helps us understand the prognosis. We can see on, on, the, on the mybography if the glands are, are present or not present. It helps me know what kind of benefit we're going to get through treatment. And of course, um, educating the patients and communication, that's, that's key. So the more imaging equals better education, which each equals uh, greater patient empowerment and equals more successful outcomes. If the patients understand what this is all about and they're on board with it, they're gonna do what they need to, uh, to improve that situation. Um, and so my, my note down below says it's impossible to be a dry eye expert without the proper tools. Um, and so before I got my instrument to be able to do my biography, um, I, I, had, I had a lot of treatments that I was, I was trying, but there was a lot of times where it was unsuccessful. I didn't, didn't get the results that I wanted to because I wasn't able to get to the underlying condition. Now I know with this instrument, I can get to the underlying condition and I can recommend the treatments that are appropriate. Now, my warming gland dysfunction is oftentimes the underlying culprit for the dry eye disease. And as I mentioned earlier, um, it's, it's the thing that kind of exacerbates virtually, virtually all of dry eye. Um, it's the result of obstructive disease and causes loss of, of, of uh, homeostasis within the tears. Um, obstruction results in stagnation of lipid oils, uh, or lipids and oils, and causes atrophy and loss of oil glands. And going back to the, um, again, down below, we've got the grading system where you can see uh, that um, as it gets worse and worse and worse, um, with those glands that can contribute to a more severe dry eye situation. Now, I, 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 I have a at-home foundational kind of treatment that I put together for my patients. Uh, consists of uh, fish oils and, um, and a, a certain ratio, uh, three to one EPA to DHA ratio, omega-3s, um, and basically taken for six to eight weeks, this will help Get those proper oils in, back into the um, oil glands and back into the tears, and it improves lip, lipid quality of the tears and stability of the tears. Now, blink exercises. So again, you've got to blink properly. Okay, if you don't blink fully and completely, you're going to have dry eye problems eventually. Um, lid hygiene. I actually recommend uh, hypochlorous acid. Um, the one I use is called Pure and Clean, and it's a it's a spray that that you close your eyes, you spray on, you rub it in, and let it dry. And it kills 99.9% .9 of the bacteria uh, once it's dried. Uh, it does a, it's a great job for, for lid hygiene. And it's safe. It feels like water. Um, and then warm heat, uh, heat mask. So um, by the way, washcloths don't cut it here. Uh, they don't hold the heat long enough. Uh, you're going to want to get a heat mask that, um, that you can warm up in the microwave for about 30 seconds. Uh, and then you put it on your, uh, close your eyes, put it on there, strap it on. And for five tenths to 10 minutes, and then you gently massage the glands and express those oils, uh, rolling your, your, your fingers upward on the lids on the bottom and downward on the top lids to get those oils to express once they've melted. Um, those, that's like a kind of home foundational treatment right there. Um, so what about our artificial tears? As I mentioned earlier, they act more like a band-aid. They help for a moment, but they're not gonna treat that underlying cause. Um, one of my goals is to create an outcome where it reduces the number of times you're reaching for those artificial tears to help out because your, your eyes are doing their job correctly. Um, but until then, artificial tears can be a benefit. And in-office procedures for managing my booming gland dysfunction are often necessary in combination with this home treatment. So in-office procedural 
um, approaches, are, as I mentioned, are, are uh, often necessary. You've got that gland obstruction, uh, which is the key uh, driver for, my, uh, for, for meibomian gland dysfunction. Um, and getting those glands clear, getting those clogged glands um, so they're not clogged anymore, uh, is probably the most important thing you can do to affect the treatment for, for, for meibomian gland dysfunction. Um, but first, we've got to get that biofilm off the lids. And it's been building up there for probably for many years. Um, and if we can get it cleaned off, then that opens up the orifices, the openings of the glands to allow those, those oils to come out more easily. Um, and then, of course, there's, there's advanced expressions. Uh, there's different instruments out there. You may have heard of LipaFlow. Uh, Ilux is a compatible instrument. Um, and this improves gland function through warming the glands and expressing the meibomian oils, the oils out of the glands. Uh, through applying localized heat and pressure therapy. There's also IPL, you may have heard of that, intense pulse light. And this uh, stimulates or jump starts the gland activity through cellular upregulation or, or, or what's called photobiomodulation. Um, and again, it, it helps those glands to, to start functioning again. Um, LLLT or low level light therapy is another um, treatment we have. Uh, and this uh, is a specific form of light that helps kill overpopulated bacteria and drains glands that are bogged down. So, um, Basically, it also works on the cell level, um, affects the mitochondria, uh, producing more ATP, which increases the, the heat, um, increases the oxygen, and gets rid of those toxic things that are in the, in the cells as well. Here's an example of biofilm. Um, and by the way, as we look at this, uh, one of the uh, things we're seeing here, uh, you can see the vasculature on the lid margin. That is an indication um, for ocular uh, rosacea. Um, and ocularization is, it commonly occurs with meibomian gland dysfunction. This is an example of the bacteria that can get on the lids and lashes, the yellowing of the, on the lashes. Uh, that's from staphylococcal black, um, blepharitis. It looks yellow um, and it's debris that's on the lashes. And again, those are things that we need to clean off to have a better outcome. This is, um, so when you see these little collarettes on the base of the lashes, that's an indication you have mites in your follicles, on your, on your lash follicles. Um, when, when people have mites that can cause a, kind of a itchy eyelid uh, sensation, irritation there. Uh, tea tree oil um, actually causes damage to the meibomian glands, which, and, and by the way, tea tree oil is common to prescribe for, um, for this, uh, for the mites, because it killed the mites. Um, however, high concentration can also damage the, the meibomian glands. Um, and so you can use, we use it a lower concentration, but it's not as effective. Um, and what we're finding is that the, the only real effective treatment for, for the mites is the LLLT blue mask followed by a red mask. Um, and we use those in 15 minute increments. Um, here are some of the instruments I use. Uh, the this first one on the left is called Blep X, and, and it's kind of like a, a Q-tip that, that uh, um, uh, goes at a very high speed. And, and we use it to clean off the lids and lashes that combined with a mild soap. Um, the other one is called the Cystine Ilux. Uh, so you may have heard of Cystine as one of the eye drops people use. This is the, the, the company that owns this, that produces this. And uh, we use this again to heat up the oil glands and, and help those, those oils um, come out. And helps restore the gland function. This on the left is, it's actually the same instrument in my office. Um, it's one all in one, uh, but the IPL um, uh, shows the, there's just those for different uh, uh, contraptions. We have a mask for the LLT, uh, where we have a, a high pulse light for the, for the uh, IPL, um, but that helps rejuvenate the glands again, gets them functioning, uh, helps them to, to warm up and and the LLT, the, the warmth lasts, but the IPL, the warmth lasts all over just a few minutes, uh, whereas LLT, the warmth lasts for about 28 minutes after the, after the procedure, um, a 15 minute procedure. Um, and then it continues to last, both of them continue to last in terms of helping those, those uh, oils express more easily. Again, here's an example of the red mask LLT treatment. Uh, this is what, it's, what, what it looks like. And again, it's an energy-based treatment that is applied over to the upper face of both eyelids when both eyelids closed. Uh, therapy is delivered via a mask using light emitting diodes or L, um, uh, LEDs with specific wavelengths. Uh, cells can be activated um, after only a 15 minute application of light. Uh, this re-energizes the cells and improves function and productivity warm them and melting the clogged oils and resulting in symptom relief. 
And it's important to understand too that dry eye is a, definitely a chronic disease. Um, and even though we go through these treatments, um, for a lot of people, it gives a, quite a bit of relief, but they may be coming back down the road for other treatments, um, just because again, it's a chronic uh, condition. So five questions to ask um, to, to kind of evaluate for yourself. If you may have dry eye, may, maybe need to have a, 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 be evaluated for it. So first, do, you, do your eyes ever feel irritated, dry, or burned? Uh, second, are your eyes red? Uh, third, do you experience blurred vision, especially fluctuating vision? Uh, fourth, oh, here's an interesting thing, the blurred vision thing. You know, one of the things that, that uh, stands out to me when I do eye exams is, you know, there might be times when people are reading the, the, the eye chart and they're doing great and then they blink and they're not doing so great or they're not doing great and then they blink and they're doing better. That's a dry eye situation. Um, also, do you find that you, you have an urge to grab for artificial tears? And then how much time are you spending in front of your digital device every day? Because that may be contributing also to dry eye symptoms. Now I've got a, a little bit of a bonus. Uh, let's look at the time here. A little bit of a bonus eye misalignment um, uh, thing here. Want to go over that? Um, so with, with the advent of, of the computer and the the cell phones and the, and the iPads, uh, we're seeing a dramatic shift in remote working, um, learning patient symptomology is accelerating rapidly. Uh, based on lifestyle index data from over 160,000 patients, over 85% experience headaches and over 77% experience a dry eye sensation uh, with some level of frequency. Uh, and the industry commonly uh, refers to this as either computer vision syndrome or digital vision syndrome. Uh, this is also known as trigeminal dysphoria and as a result of eye misalignment. So I'm going to go through this um, um, slide just a bit. I'm going to go through this, go to the next one first. So optometry and neurology kind of got together and they created a, a lens called Neurolens. Um, with Neurolens, it relieves the symptoms of headaches, stiffness uh, of the neck or neck pain, eye strain, fatigue, dry eye, light sensitivity, and dizziness. Um, your eyes are working hard. And even small misalignments can cause painful symptoms. Uh, and even small prism corrections can provide dramatic relief. And that's what the neural lens does. So when you come in for an eye exam in my office, um, my goal is to get you to see 20-20 vision. Uh, but I also want, your, I want to make sure your eyes are working well together. If your eyes don't work well, then and you're going to potentially have some of these symptoms. Um, so we give you a symptom questionnaire to fill out. And if you score a three or above, we run the neural lens assessment. Um, so, so it helps us understand if your eye alignment is off uh, because again, it affects your visual comfort. And it gives us a readout. And this is the readout that we get. Uh, so this, this is actually a readout of my son's um, uh, assessment. And what we're seeing here on the, on the inside that, that box, uh, we've got the, uh, we're assessing the horizontal eye alignment. And on the left side of it, we've got your distance. And on the right side, we have the near. And the green indicates where your eyes are pointing, or I should say, the green indicates ideally where your eyes should point. It should point and come together a line right at that object you're looking at. In my son's case, uh, his eyes were aligning behind the object. Uh, to take it a step further, just imagine yourself sitting down at the end of the day on your couch wanting to watch TV. Okay, so instead of your eyes coming into alignment right at the TV screen, they're coming in behind the TV screen. So your brain says, hey, I don't like this because I'm seeing a little bit of doubleness. So it will automatically cause your eyes to pull up together to see singly, okay? And so realize that you're doing this all day long. Anytime you're driving and you're looking at the car in front of you, the stop sign, you know, a kid running across the street, your eyes have to realign and, and uh, make up the difference from where the ideal is to where they actually are. And that can put some strain on your eyes uh, as it's done you know, over and over and over all day long. At near, we see here in his situation that his eyes are aligning um, further back. And so it takes greater effort up close to get him to, to see single and clear uh, than he should have to. Now, what's interesting is, is since this is my son, I can tell you a bit more about it. Uh, we had just gotten him um, uh, his first cell phone and it had been about a year and he came complaining of headaches. 
Um, and of course, that correlated that the, when the complaint started, it correlated with when he got the cell phone. So we got him a neural lens and it using PRISM, um, uh, it helped alleviate those symptoms. So he doesn't complain of headaches anymore. He still spends all his time on, on his phone, but he's not uh, got the headaches. So how does this action work? Um, so basically, the neural lens uses contoured prism to bend light. To, you have to understand the prism bends light. And so when, when we put prism in glasses, uh, we're, we're, we're taking an image with one eye and shifting it. And by doing that, we can actually uh, make your, your, your eyes work harder or make your eyes um, um, work less hard. And so in this situation with the neural lens, um, we use contour prisms. So just like my son had, had a greater degree of need of help, uh, need for help at near, uh, we can actually use greater amounts of prism at the bottom of the lens than we have at the top of the lens. And it's the only lens that does this, that has a contour prism ability to do that. So that when people are working, uh, they're getting the relief they need in wherever position they're, they're working, whether it's they're looking far away or whether they're looking up close to give them that relief. So relief is in sight. Um, so even though, even though with, um, with eye misalignment, it may not cause the loss of vision and the potential blindness that other diseases have, it still affects people um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I'm gonna, and it can alleviate a lot of the symptoms that people experience, um, especially with all the work, close work that they're doing now. So I've got a few testimonials I wanna read through um, I, and, I, and, I, and I would like to share this with you, but this is from Cheryl P, um, February of this year. She says, I had been really struggling with dry, watery, irritated dry eyes. And when I came in for my eye exam, a new prescription, I was encouraged to try Neuralens. It was an investment that I decided to accept their professional advice. And wow, has it been worth it? No more dry eyes. The lens made a difference almost instantly. Thank you for your excellent care and recommendation. Heather P in November, 2021 said, much improved vision and relieved my tired eyes, which have plagued me for decades. Also cleared up light sensitivity, which was a big problem. Now I want to share with you our, 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 our experience in, in bringing the neural lens into our office because I wasn't convinced initially. Um, so I'd like to share that. So before, before I had to, um, agreed to bring the neural lens in, um, we had one of our employees who came to my, my office manager and asked her if she knew of anything to help with headaches. Uh, she said her 11 year old son had been, she'd taken her 11 year old son to, to several um, um, doctors to try to figure out why he was getting headaches and none of them figured out. He went through test after test after test with no results until she went to one uh, doctor who said he needed, he needed surgery. And he, he caused her to stop and take a step back. It's like, how is it these other doctors saying there's no problem at all? And now one doctor says there's surgery. So she came to my, my, to, to, to my office manager and said, do you know of anything that can, do, can be done to help with, with headaches? And at that time, we had the um, the the vendor, uh, Neuralens vendor, come in and, and wanted to speak with us and told us a little bit about it. And, and again, I was a little hesitant, uh, but we asked him, "Well, could you provide some glasses to this young boy?" And he said, "Sure." So we arranged to get him the glasses, and uh, almost instantly, um, when he got those glasses on, his headaches diminished. And, and this is what his his mother had to say about that. Um, she says, within the first couple of days of my son, my son noticed relief, especially after doing homework and up close reading. It's now been a couple of months and still no headaches. Neuralens gave my son his life back. Now, to me, that was very, very convincing. And so uh, from that point on, we decided, well, let's invest in the money to, to bring this in and let's help those patients that we've been missing all these years. You know, and I started identifying people before we even got it saying, oh, I wish I had Oh boy, I wish I, I wish I could uh, um, help these people, but I don't know a way. Well, the Neuralens gave me that way to help these people with their headaches. 
And here's another example, Rick, um, in January of this year, he said, for most of my adult life, I've suffered from neck tension headaches almost daily. For the last year, I have been constantly dizzy with a headache. I had many tests saw many doctors and had an MRI with no answers. My niece who works for Dr. Five at Paradise Canyon Night Care told me about the Neuralens glasses. I made the appointment, had the test and ordered my new glasses. I figured there, there, I figured there would be an adjustment period, but as soon as I put them on, my dizziness went away. It's been a month and I haven't been dizzy or had any headaches, tension or otherwise since. I am amazed and grateful. Um, again, I'm hearing, I hear these stories a lot. Uh, one, one story that really stands out to me um, was um, a lady that came in who had um, been having migraines since she's three years old. Um, and I'm just gonna read this to you so I don't get it wrong, but uh, on April 4th, 2022, I was dropping my kids off at the bus stop. And I noticed that she was starting to walk toward me um, there at the bus stop. And, and so I rolled the window down, and my kids got out. And she said to me, thank you for investing in the Neuralens technology. Um, I, I don't have many people stop me on the street thanking me for what I've done with their vision and, and getting just getting rid of headaches. Um, and so that, that meant a lot to me personally. Um, but I had, I had talked to her previously to this. And you know when she picked her glasses up, uh, this is what she had to say about that. Um, so she said, let's see. She said, this is the first time um, I have felt centered in my entire life. Now that, that speaks volumes. Um, and then that week after she picked them up, there was a storm that came through St. George. And she, um, she, she came, the, the following week she came back and talked to me. And she said it's the first time in her life she'd not had a major migraine because of the change in barometric pressure, um, because of the neural that she's wearing. And she didn't even recognize it until after the fact. And she's like, wait, I didn't have a headache all, all through that storm. Well, the following week, well, another storm came rolling through and she, she paid close attention. And again, she didn't have a headache. Uh, and she says, previous to this, she's always getting a headache, um, a migraine headache, whenever the barometric pressure changed from storms. Uh, and so, again, these are just examples of, of um, patients that I've seen that have been affected by this. And, and, and it's more common than to realize. Um, had, you, had you come to me a year ago, I would, it would have been clueless about this. Um, I didn't know about it uh, until um, I had the opportunity to experience it um, with my patients and by myself um, and in my own, my own family's life. So, again, Neuralens is, is, is amazing. Um, so for here's, I've got a special offer here for you. Um, for any Huntsman Senior Games athlete um, or employee who comes into our office and mentions this webinar, we will offer free dry eye or Neuralens screening. Okay. Um, now my office is located on, on Snow Canyon Parkway, just a half mile off of Bluff as you go toward Entrada. Um, and my office number is there below. You can call and, and schedule time to do that, or you can just walk in and we can try to fit you in or schedule a time at that point in time to, to do that screening. Um, so thank you for, for letting me come and present. And again, life is all about your vision. Awesome. Wow, that's a lot of information there. All the important things that we need to understand and recognize and learn and know about our eyesight. Um, a lot of information. So thank you so much. Uh, I do have just, uh, we, we've kind of used up our time, but I have a couple of quick questions that maybe you can answer quickly. Um, one that came in from one of our uh, attendees, when looking to buy sunglasses, what is the best parameter to look for? And also tell, talk a little bit about blue filtering glasses for computer use. Yes. So let's start with the blue filtering glasses first off. Um, that is important to have. And so I, I, I pretty much recommend it for most people uh, if they're gonna be on the computer. Uh, and, and, and the glasses I'm wearing right now, they have that blue filter in them. So it's hard to detect in many of the pairs of glasses. So you don't have to have the yellow, although we do have those as well. Uh, but the clear pair, they work great. Um, and they can filter out that, that, uh, um, the blue light. Now, if someone has macular degeneration, then I'm gonna recommend maybe going toward the more yellow for that. But if you don't have it, 
the clear pair works great to help again offset that the blue light from coming in. Um, as far as the sunglasses go, uh, polarized sunglasses are wonderful when you're when you're outdoors. Uh, but you may be one of those people that want to go indoor outdoor and want the transition lenses. That is an option as well. They both filter out the, the blue light. They, uh, they also both filter out the UV light. Uh, and that's important. Uh, now, recognize that when you have the transition lens, it's activated by the UV light from the sun. So when you're outside working in your yard and it's, uh, it's got, you got the full on dark lenses on, uh, you step inside your vehicle, close the door, and guess what happens? Those, those lenses lighten up. And you don't have that protection like you did when you're outside your vehicle. And that's why, that's personally, I actually use a, a uh, polarized sunglass, a sunglass when I go driving. And I use my uh, transition lenses when I'm running in the morning before light comes up. And as light comes up, I, I transition to darker. Um, so I've got that protection. Okay, wonderful. One more quick question. Uh, does, does increased sensitivity to light when driving at night mean you are developing cataracts or is it some of this normal when you're over the age of 60? That's a great question. So as far as over the age 60 goes, you're most likely um, developing cataracts at that point. Um, so, so again, it's age-related cataracts, right? And so uh, as we age, they come on. You've had a lot of exposure to UV light through your, through your years. Um, and just, so, so cataracts, let's think about this for just a second. Um, what, what is a cataract? So just like when you're outside in the sun and you get that UV exposure and you get sunburned or suntanned, well, that light is going through your pupil and tanning that lens inside your eye. So through the course of your lifetime, it's building up and building up with your skin, it's soft off. There's nowhere for it to go inside your eye. So that lens gets, gets more and more yellow. And as it gets more and more yellow, that forms the cataract. And so, yeah, that is probably contributing to your light sensitivity from the glare. And we also have those lights, the, the blue LED lights that I, I personally think they should be illegal. Uh, they're so bright, they affect everybody. Awesome, okay. Well, thank you once again, Dr. Fife, so much. Great information, uh, a lot of information. Um, we just wanna uh, wish you the very best in your practice and uh, hopefully we'll see you on down the road. Thank you very much, I appreciate the opportunity. To be here. Thanks, Dr. Fife. And also thank you so much for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's webinar, be sure to let your friends know about the Living Your Best Life webinar series. This presentation will also be available to rewatch at seniorgames.net. And we want to invite you to join us next month for another episode of the Living Your Best Life webinar series. Dr. Keith Darrow is going to talk about the advances in the medical treatment of hearing loss and tinnitus. And that is going to take place on August 16th at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. And until we meet again, get out there and live your best life. Thanks, everyone.